And so today's message, uh, by the grace of God, I'll be preaching on grace for the race. Wow. Grace for the race. Let me tell you about grace for the race. Grace. Now, for those of you who are not saying it, saying it very well, you understand at the end of the day, by the time I paint the picture of the race, you will agree with me that you really need the grace for the race. What is the race of marriage? How I many of you are married? Can I see you? Now, let's sincerely speaking, do you think you need grace for that race? Uh-oh. <laughs> how, many people are raising, how many people are raising children? Do you think you need grace to raise children? Okay. Now, if you think you need grace to raise little children, trust me, when, you're raising, when they become teenagers, then you need more grace. <laughs> Especially in this country. <laughs> Praise God. Because all of a sudden, they will know better than you. Amen. <laughs> if, if, you have ever, if you have never lived with any woman before in your life, and you're just suddenly married, you just wake up one day and just say, I'm married to a stranger. How many of you know that you need grace to live with that kind of person? Some of you just say yes to a stranger in the mall. And after some time, one, one year, two years later, you're married. And you don't think you need grace to live with somebody you just met two years ago? I mean, if you have always needed grace to live with your father and your mother, that you have always known. So who tells you that you don't need grace to live with somebody that you just met two years ago? If some people are married in six months, you, you want to live for the rest of your life with somebody you just met six months ago? And you don't think you need grace for that? Amen. Yeah. You know, people are just casual with life. And so they don't think they, they need grace. But I found out that the race of life, we need grace, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Amen. And so this morning, by the grace of God, I, I want to talk to us on grace for the race. I, and my text is taken from Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 13 to 14. And the other one is Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Glory be to God. We talked about grace to overcome and to endure last week. Man, and I've been getting text and you know a lot of messages of encouragement to say that that message was just a home run. For, for some of us that and, and God blessed us and I'm telling you by God's grace today God is going to help us to take this on our level entirely amen so Philippians 3 and we're going to read together uh, from the New King James version of the Holy Bible are we ready Paul was speaking here now now, now this was Paul Apostle who wrote two thirds of the New Testament but, but look at what but look at what he says brethren I do not count myself to have apprehended you know what I do not count myself to have you know reached the goal so to speak but one thing I was say one thing please say it aloud but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. Everybody say forward. forward. To those things which are ahead. Glory to God. Now look at verse 14. I press. Everybody say I press. I press. Come on, say it aloud. I press. I press. Say it aloud. Come on. I press. Toward the goal <laughs> for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now the second text is taken from the book of Acts 19. Come on, let's get ready to read that one also. Grace for the race. And I'm going to be reading a couple of scriptures this morning. I'll be reading from my notes also because, like I said, God has anointed my pen, the pen of a writer, to write, write my sermon sometime and I preach it extemporaneously as the case may be. Now, Paul said this, and I'm going to explain the context of what he says here later in the message. When these things were accomplished, we're going to know those things later because you need to read in context. Paul purposed in the spirit. When he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. <laughs> you know, I preached a message, I must get to Rome some years ago. And, uh, you know, some of my friends, pastor friends that I preached there, in their churches said that it was it was this classic message that will after has left an indelible mark on the sands of their time. I'm not going to do that this morning, but I'm going to give you, give you a, an abridged version of what I preached many years ago. Uh, uh, but I'm going to link it up with God's grace because you're going to see why getting to Rome was a big deal for Apostle Paul. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, none of me but all of you think through my mind and speak through my focal cords. Send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Anoint my lips of clay with your glory and honor and power. Help me to didactically exegesis and explain and declare and prophesy, prophesy and proclaim your word with definite prophetic oracular authors to the specific names of the hour in the lives of your people. Lord, confirm your words with signs and wonders following and let all glory and honor 
be ascribed unto you ahead of time and at the end of the day in the precious name of Jesus and the church said a big amen. amen. Grace for the race. See, the moment a person decides to do something unusual, the moment you decide to do something extraordinary with your life, the moment, the moment you want to embark on something that is not common, the moment you make up your mind to do something that is of that is not what every other person does, it looks like hey, all hell will break loose and things may start falling apart. I read a book by one of the Nigerian foremost novelists many years ago, Chino Achebe. Many of you have read the book, Things Fall Apart. The central and old. See, when things begin to happen, the way you have planned, then it means that you don't have something extraordinary. Mm. When your life is always rosy, I doubt it if you have anything tangible to offer. But the moment you begin to say, you know what? I dare to be extraordinary. I want to be different. I want to make a change. Then it appears if all end will break loose because I just made up your mind. Misunderstandings, criticisms, Resentments, hatred, jealousy, betrayal, and all kinds of terrible things will be marshaled at, your, at, at you just to make you cave in or give up. Whether it is in marriage, whether it is in finance, whether it is in your purpose in life, whether it is, whether it is, it is, in, it is in your relationship, you are going to come under a series of attacks of the enemy because you have dared to be different. Especially if you now want to go to the territories of the cartels and the mafias of this world. Get ready for battle. In Acts 19, where we have read, the Bible says, Apostle Paul said, I must always, I must also see Rome. In other words, I must travel to Rome. I must go to Rome. But you see, prior to that time, in Acts 19, before you get to verse 21, where he made that statement, when you read from verse 1, the Bible says he was in Ephesus. And he had an encounter with certain disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he asked them, have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost since you became born again? And the answer was, we do not know anything about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then he said, unto which baptism are you, are you then baptized? And they said, we are baptized into the, the baptism of John the Baptist. In other words, these guys, even though they were born again, they were still living in the past. Because John the Baptist announced categorically that his job and ministry was to introduce the Savior. That we introduced the new covenant. But even when Jesus paid the price, he rose from the dead, they shed the blood and rose from the dead, some people were still living in the past. You see, I just wrote an article recently and I say that the church of Jesus must learn to move from where God was to where God is. When you camp around what God said, it is dangerous. You need to understand the difference between what God said and what he is now saying. In Genesis 22, the Bible says, And God said to Abraham, Your son, your only boy, Isaac, that you loved, offer him more for me, on the, mount, on, on the mountain called Moriah. That was what God said. And this guy took a knife and, and, and went for three days until he got to the mountain. And the Bible says he lifted up his hand to cut off the throat of this boy to offer him as a sacrifice. But the Bible says, and the word of the Lord God came from heaven saying, do not kill the boy. God said before, kill him. But God is now saying, do not. In 1 Kings 17, the Bible says, and God said to Elijah the Tishbite, he said, move to the call to the blue called Cherith, for there I have commanded a widow, I'm sorry, I commanded the ravens to feed thee. But the Bible says, after some time, the brook dried up, and the ravens stopped bringing food. And the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, now move to Sarephath, for there I have commanded the widow, a widow dead, to feed thee. So God said, move to the blue called chariot, 
But God is not saying. So if Elijah had remained in the brook because God said he would starve to death. So there's a difference between what God said and what God is saying. The Bible is now saying to us, the new way of, of the new covenant, of the way of grace, is that God is the same God. God is not schizophrenic. God has not changed, but he has changed his methodologies. Are you listening to me? So he said to them, there is something about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, and he laid hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. But after that, what happened? The Bible says he began to preach Jesus Christ to the other people in the Ephesus, and they were becoming, they were becoming born again, and they were being filled with the Holy Ghost to a point of the Bible, says, and special miracles were being wrought from the hands of Apostle Paul to a point of handkerchiefs and aprons were coming off his body to heal the diseased people and also to cast out devils. Now, that was awesome. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was great. The miracles coming out, I mean, come from the Apostle Paul was, was splendid. But then the Bible says, and they saw a man that was demon possessed, and he said, In the name of Jesus Christ, that Paul talks about. They did not have a personal encounter with him directly. But they were trying to be imitators, they were trying to be phony. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ that Paul talks about, we command you to come out. And the Bible says the, the, the person in whom the demons were, you know, was under the influence of the demonic power. And the demons left in them, I mean left in this guy, and overpowered the people that were trying to cast out the demons. Because the demons said, Paul, we know. Jesus, we know. Who are you? Ladies and gentlemen, are you knowing hell? Let me say this to you. Every child of God that is making a mark on the, that, that's going to live in his footprint on the sand of time must be known in two places in eternity. You must be known in heaven and you must be known in hell. If they don't know you in hell, you don't know anything. What I'm saying is that I'm not saying you should go to hell for you to be known. But I'm saying you should be a terrorist to the devil. To a point that they will know you. Glory be to God. Known in hell. So if the Paul we know, Jesus we know, who are you? And the Bible says, they strip them naked. The demons strip them. The, the, the story is there. Glory be to God. But you see, that was, that was fabulous. But again, the same Acts of Apostles 19. We now get to a point when the Bible says that some people had the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and were convinced of what Paul was saying. The resurrection and, and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And, and they gave their lives to Christ. And without being told, they began to bring up their occultic books out. And they were burning them into, into shreds. They burn them into, they, they burn them, they, they set their books, their cutting books aflame because they had an encounter with Jesus. Now, one would think that all of these achievements are great in themselves. And everything I've just said that happened in Acts 19 and the previous chapters, are they great or not? How many of us have achieved that in this lifetime? If anybody has done that, that person should go and rest in peace because they have done a lot. But, I was not, but not for possible. Now said, thank God for all of these things. I thank you, God, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost that is happening, to, that people are getting through me. I thank God for the occult people that have been destroyed. And I thank God for, 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 the, for the demons that are coming out of people from, from the handkerchief coming from me and, and for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I thank God for all of that. But I'm not going to rest on my words until I get to Rome. So that was the context of that statement. That's why the Bible says, and after these things, he said, I must also see Rome. Hmm. Please, ladies and gentlemen, I want to listen very, very carefully. Because you see, your own Rome in this context may be different from what Apostle Paul was saying. Rome in this context is something that is very spectacular and extraordinary. Rome is your destiny. Rome speaks of your purpose in life. Rome speaks of the call of God upon your life that the enemy is trying to fight by all means. So it's not about you. It's about where you're going. But I've come to prophesy on somebody today and I've come to declare by the grace of God that it does not matter all of the things the devil is marshalling against you. The grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit will see you through and you will get to Rome. Amen. If I'm talking to you, say a big amen. amen. Because you're talking about race. For the grace. Now listen to this very carefully. 
Now, I don't have enough time to go into all of the details of what happened to this man after he declared I must also see room. All of a sudden, it looks like all of the demons in hell just woke up. And hell over here broke loose. Because of that announcement. And because of time, I can't go into it. But if you, if you I don't know, maybe, maybe the cities are, are city available in the archive. But you see, I talked about some of the things he went through. He had shipwreck. Because he was on his way to Rome and, and he was imprisoned. Because of that announcement. At the point when he finally was going to go get the, you know, in the shipwreck, he had the shipwreck to upon the Lord. The ship, the boat was broken into pieces. And he had to escape by one of the broken bottles. I mean, one of the broken pieces of, of, of the ship. And he got to one island. And, and as if that was not enough, the Bible says they, they, they go to that island of Melita during winter. And because of cold, they gather some sticks together to warm themselves. One would think that the, the devil has had enough of our support. But the devil is a bastard. He, he's, he, he's, he's, he does not give on people, especially when you are, when you are in the territory of, of his mafia and cartel. What happened? The Bible says, and there was a venomous viper that came out of the wood that they were using to, 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 to make fire, to warm themselves. And it wrapped itself around Apostle Paul's hand. And the Bible says, I love what the Bible says, but Paul shook it into the fire. My goodness. And every beast around you today in the name of Jesus, when no matter where they're coming from, whether it's from Africa or from Asia, they are going to the fire in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the people of the islands say, oh, 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 oh. You know, now this guy must be something else. Because, you see, human beings are very inconsistent. At some point, they will follow you. At some point, they will change their mind. They said, crucify Jesus. And they said, Osana in the highest before. So, they, they, they said, when they saw that, this man had a snake, a, a venom. I don't have enough time to go into the, into the suggestions of what that kind of snake does. Because, you see, when that snake, kind of snake should bind you, uh, it releases the poison into your system and it gets into your blood and you're supposed to die on the spot. Don't forget that we, don't, we didn't have those medical breakthroughs in those days. Uh, and so Apostle Paul so said, so people say, uh, vengeance is, is following this man. That he escaped the rot of the sea. But the, what he has done is not going to leave him alone. Now on the island again, a snake is wrapping himself around you. This man must be a terrible man. That's what they said. And the Bible says that they were waiting for him to swell up. Because when, when nothing binds you, you are going to swell up and bust. So they were waiting for him to, to die. But when they found out he did not die, the Bible says, and they said, he must be a God. Think their mind. Human beings are always inconsistent. Now, I've, let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. There are some people who will not believe in your dream. They do not believe that this is possible. But don't give in. Keep moving forward. And after some time, they will change their mind again and say, well, this guy can do it. Because human beings are just I told last week that 97 percent of human beings are followers, only three percent are leaders. The 97 percent will always doubt the three percent. But if the three percent will not give in or give up, the 97 percent will say, Well, that guy knows what he's doing. Remember the sons of the prophet? They will tell Elisha that you do you know that your master will take him from you off your head today? And you say, I know. They did it in Jericho, they did it in Gilga, they did it in Better, and they kept telling them the same, same, same thing. We know. I know that it's going to be taken from, from me today. And at the point, the Bible says about 50 of them will gather themselves together and they begin to mock this man. See, see, Elijah. <laughs> he doesn't know that Elijah will be taken from him today. And they were mocking the man. But blessed be God, because this man called Elijah will not give in or give up. Because he was not an ordinary man in the kingdom of God. Glory be to God. He said, I'm going to stay with you until you are taken off in the chariot of fire into heaven. And the Bible says, when the chariot of fire came around to separate him from Elijah, he said something. He said, oh, my father, my father. In other words, I can see you because the man said, if you can see me, go up. You're going to have my mantle. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, the mind to our power is not meant for the lily liver. It's not meant for those who are insipid. It is for those who are strong will. And in, not, not in their strong will, but in their, in their not in the grace of God. The man, one person against 50 sons of the other prophets. My goodness. By the end of the day, the mantle dropped. The people mocking him, look at what happened. The Bible says, and Elisha gathered the mantle together. And when they got to Jordan River, <laughs> because they are saying the way the man of God was using it, his father, spiritual father was using it, he wrapped the mantle together. And he said something. He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? 
and he smote the Jordan River. And the Bible says, and the river parted into two, and they walked on the dry ground. And the same prophet, sons of the prophet that were mocking him before said, the Bible says, and they bowed down to him. And they say, the anointing of Elijah, Elijah is resting upon him. You see, how inconsistent people can be. Look at what this man had to go through to get to where he was going to go. Let, let me read a couple of scriptures to you. <laughs> Second Corinthians 11, my goodness. Huh? No, no, listen to me. Buy this city today. What I'm saying may not make sense to you right now. But I'm telling you it is prophetic for somebody. It's making sense to some people already. But whether you're a businessman or you're a husband or you're a mother or you're, or you're a homemaker or whatever you are called, you are called to do, you we need this message someday. The only time you don't need this message is if you want to live an ordinary life. Second Corinthians, quickly, 11. Look at verse 25. Let's start from verse 22. Yes. Apostle Paul here, look at what he was talking about, boasting the grace of God. Look at what he has to say. He said, Are they Hebrews talking about other apostles and other, other people? Are they Hebrews? So I am. Are they Israelites? So I am. Are they the seed of Abraham? So I am. Look at the next verse. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. No, no, let me boast in the flesh. I am more. In labors, more abundant. L look at what the man had to go through to get to where he was going. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. Now, how many of you here have gone to the prison not because you committed a crime, but because you are doing the right thing? You see, that's why I said earlier today that we have a whining generation today. People stay away from the church. They stay away from the things of God. They stay away from things that can bless them because of some petty, petty issue. We have not even been to prison yet. For, for the right thing. For, for, for the cause of the gospel. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. My God. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That's, that was 39. My goodness. <laughs> Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And you know what? According to uh, historians, when he was stoned, he was stoned actually in one of the chapters, you know, on Acts of Apostles, he was stoned and they, they thought he was dead. And when breeze here came upon him, I believe it was the breeze of Greece, he woke up again. And they went back into the temple to preach. The same reason why they beat him. My God. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, I traveled the world, Asia Minor, Greece, Ephesus, all these places. And in those days, the travel convenience were not there like we have, like we have it today. Some people complain because they, they, they don't put them in the first class. They, you know, they, 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 and they are bitter and depressed because they couldn't travel in first class. This guy, is what, this guy was traveling, journeys often in, having shipwreck, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. So armed robbers was not peculiar to Nigeria. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. Oh, you know, it's getting deeper now. I, I'm very sad. One, one would think that your own country people should support you. You know, I found out that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, the Bible says in the book of Matthew 10, verse 46, that a man's foe shall be day of his own household. Countrymen, which word against him. In Paris, of the Gentiles, the people that have been sent to, they are persecuting me. Painful. In Paris, in the city. In Paris, in the wilderness. Everywhere I turn to, there seem to be attacks around me. When I relocate to the city, peril. I go back to the village, peril. Paris in the wilderness, Paris in the sea, in Paris among false brethren. Those who persecute you falsely and cook up story against you and gang up against you. Persecute you for nothing. Just for envy, bitterness, resentment, and just hatred that has no basis and unfounded. In wilderness, sometimes I'm tired, I have to be honest. Paul said. And toil in sleeplessness. I can relate with this. Oh, in hunger, not that I'm fasting, but there's not enough for food for me. 
and thirst. Now he now says fasting. So that's me. That's the difference between hunger and fast. To let you know. In fasting often. In cold. No winter jacket. You have a winter jacket today. And you are still whining. And nakedness. Now, look at this. You know what? Besides the other things, you know what? Other things I cannot talk about. However, I do not take all those things. All these things I've just listened to them seriously. Why? Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Let's stop. We may never know what pastors go through. Except they say. We may never know what, go, what men of God go through. Except they say. The man says, everything I've been through is relevant. My only concern is to reach my goal. The key of the churches. The people, selfless leaders, my God. You know, it's not about you, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to understand something today. That business is not about you. That, that marriage is not about you. Because if God is going to bring out Leaders and generation of leaders and world changers through your marriage. Don't you think the devil is going to attack you? If, if your business is going to expand and explode, and you're going to become one of the pillars in the household of God to finance the gospel of Jesus, don't you think the enemy is going to attack that business? Don't you think the enemy is going to attack your life as a person? The moment you begin to see this thing as hey, it's about me, and you're thinking it personally, then you do not understand how the devil operates. The devil will leave you alone the day you say, I'm no longer making a difference. The devil is very, it's a very, it's very strategic. strategic. He does not bother people without a goal. Now, the question is this. Do you think for a second that the Almighty God in His infinite mercy and grace will release some level of grace into a man that has gone through all of this? Because He said in weariness. You know, sometimes even though I, I see myself as a very ruthless guy. I mean, I, I, I plant churches everywhere. I'm ready to die for this gospel. Eventually did. As a matter of fact, he died in, in the prison. He was, he was, he was cut off, his head was cut off and beheaded at the age of 92, according to historians and, and Bible scholars, by a crazy emperor there in Rome called Nero. And, and while he was waiting for his execution, he was still writing to Timothy, encouraging the brethren. Because he knew we had believed. Our generation we have gotten so many things on the path of gold that we now have an entitlement mentality. And if nobody's there for you, you take offense. But Apostle Paul was not like that. He was not a follower, but a leader. But God had to encourage him. When a person has to go through all of these types of situations in life, just to be able to fulfill purpose and destiny, he needs encouragement. And God did. In fact, he said, look, all these things I've mentioned, everything I've been through in life, they don't move me. As a matter of fact, there was a particular time that a prophet by name Prophet Agabus prophesied, took the, 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 the mantle, or no, not the mantle, no, the girdle, like a belt in those days, of, of, of Apostle Paul, and he spoke in parable. He said, whoever holds this belt is going to be persecuted in Jerusalem. And he tied it around himself. He said, this is the way the person will be bound. And he will suffer persecution in Jerusalem. And he untied himself and dropped the belt. Or, or the gadu. And Apostle Paul knew what he was talking about. Of course, if you come around and you take my jacket. And say, whoever holds the jacket, 
This is what he's going to explain. You already know I'm talking, you're talking about, you're, you're talking about me. And Paul said, I'm not just ready to be persecuted, I'm ready to die. Oh. And he said in Acts 20, 32, he says, but none of this thing, talking about persecution, resentment, hatred, betrayal, and all of that. He said, none of these things move me. Neither can't I my life dear to myself. So that I might, I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. None of them move me. Now, the question is, the second, the second part of this message, why will a man be audacious and confront the devil in his own turf, on his own turf, and his own territory with that kind of boldness? Now, that boldness was not an ordinary one. It is the kind of boldness that comes with the revelation of the grace of God. My God. That's why the title of this message is Grace for the Race. Let me tell you, grace for the race. Grace for the race. And, and everybody has it. But it depends on what to do with it. That's why Paul said, I have not received the grace of God in vain. That which means you can receive the grace of God in vain. Now listen to this. Many of us believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is, is just to, to comfort people when they are going through tragedy. But listen to this. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is not just for tragic situations. It is for everyday life. Because the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the ministry of grace. I was a ministry of grace. Because Jesus said he will glorify me. So if somebody's ministry is to glorify the person of grace, so that means that that, made that person is also gracious. So when I hear things like the Holy Spirit convicted me, or the Holy Spirit told me that if you don't do this, I will kill you, that's not the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you the truth. You know, many years ago, you know, I would always understand, I would always understood the message of God's grace, but I didn't, I didn't know the details. I was a leader of a campus fellowship many years ago, and um, there was a particular sister, you know, who stood up one day and was giving prophet, pro prophecy, and he said, "Oh, hey, hey, my people, you know, in those days, until you cry, you know, you, you couldn't give prophecy." I'm like, why, "Why do you have to cry to give prophecy?" Hey, hey, my people, my people, my people, just talk, amen. Forget about those, all those emotions. <laughs> Praise God, my people, my people, my people. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you to the close of the age. Ah. Amen. Now, now the, min, the, the every prophecy has three elements: comfort, exhortation, and edification. So, if anybody's giving a prophetic word that does not have these three components, it's not from God. I don't care what, what name he goes by. I don't care his title. Because the Bible says the, 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 the gift of prophecy will exalt. Okay? We edify, which means to build up and comfort. So, what is comforting me? My people, my people. I mean, that's depressing. Amen. And so, this particular list says I stood up. And she was going to give a prophetic, I mean, it was going to give prophecy. And she said, Thus says, says, says the Lord, Thus says the Lord, my people, my people, uh, for, you have offended me, and I've walked away. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving you. I'm leaving you. I can't stay here again. I said, What? I said, Shut up. You see, I, I, I can be very, a little bit, you know, rascally in those days, even in the faith. Amen. I mean, up to now, if you stand up to give a, some kind of depressing word, I'm sitting to start to sit down. Amen. Oh, yes. So I said, shut up. I said, keep quiet. Because that was going to bring depression into the, into, into the, into the audience. Amen. And first of all, God will never say that he will depart from us. Because I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So no prophecy will contradict God's word. Amen. So you've got to live in this world. See, see, because many of us sometimes, because a man is so called man of God, so popular man of God has said it. You know, I understand that in Nigeria now they do what they call firstborn, firstborn uh, offering or something like that. If you want your firstborn to die, you need to come and give offering, something like that. I'm like, what is the meaning of this? So somebody now goes because so many people are doing firstborn offering, so some other people are now doing lastborn offering. So, so and I ask somebody, I say, okay, so what's going to happen to the to do in the middle? If, if you need money for the ministry, just tell the people. They will give it. Teach them how to give the will. Don't manipulate them. Praise God. I said, praise the Lord. 
Now listen to this. Let me let me let's, let's move very fast. So the the Holy Spirit, the life of a believer, is the is is the front line of defense against the devil and his devices of defeat. I'm going to run very fast now so you get the city. Amen. So the phrase "God is the God of all comfort" carries the meaning of a comforter who encourages, who assists, who guides, who ref who refreshes, who aids, and who strengthens. That's that's. What that means is it's all about. The, the God of all the comfort. Not just comfort you in a particular area, but in your marriage. My God. In your finance. In, in your dealings with other people. When you are hurt. In fact, let me say this to you. I, I, some of us are getting to a point by God's grace. When we are getting to a point when we, you know, we, we say, through his grace, you have from me advanced forgiveness. Advanced forgiveness means before you offend me, I've forgiven you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. That's the part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit because the ministry of grace. Listen to this. God chooses to comfort us in different ways. He may deliver us or remove us from the cause of the affliction. You see, people try to put God in a box. Okay, God did this, did this one. And so if God's not doing their own particular way. They think God is not answering their prayer. Do you know that there are times when that one, the, the fact that God has not answered some prayers is actually answered prayer? Because he knows what you don't know. Good. Tell that man now to come and propose to me. Tell that man now to come and propose to me. And God has kept quiet. Because he knows that the man will turn into a punching bag after marriage. Because it's not ready yet. And here you are. God, please. Is he deaf? Please talk to him. I'm in love. Let him talk to me. Oh God, Lego Saka, Jinta Topa, O Krakatusa. And God is just waiting. Amen. In fact, do you know I found out that sometimes some of the things that cause problem in marriage are organized a problem sometimes to help us develop the fruit of the spirit. Amen. Like my wife preached some years ago. And she gave me a revelation that, I mean, for anybody to live with me, with me, her husband, that the person must have the gift of long suffering, which means ability to suffer long. <laughs> Amen. That was a revelation from her. <laughs> Praise God. But by the grace of God, because she had that gift, is working out now today. Praise God. Now, yeah, it took it took me took it may take us many years to act, to get that today to that place, but we're there, Amen. and we're still, we're still doing better by God's grace. Amen. Because when you're living with a man that is complicated, you need the gift and the ability to suffer long. <laughs> Amen. Praise God forever, and the gift of endurance. Amen. Praise God. So there are some problems that God. Will not, I mean, but. Can you imagine my wife saying, God, please, take this problem away from me. Take the problem away from me. I will have been dead. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So next time before you pray, you better know what you're praying about. Are you listening to me? Praise the Lord. Because he may deliver you from the problem or remove the cause of the affliction. Because I told you last Sunday, there are problems to overcome. Sickness, disease, and all of that. Poverty. But there are also problems to endure. So God may deliver us from the, or, or, or remove us from the cause of the affliction or he may comfort us with the words of hope and encouragement for the future. These are problems and challenges to endure. This life is like a big drama stage. Everybody gets to choose the role they will play. To be a hero or to be a villain. To be a victor or to be a victim. To be a whiner or to be a winner. To instigate persecution and rebellion or to encourage the persecuted. To be a taker or to be a giver. To destroy or to build. Everybody at the end of the day will be remembered for something. Some problem they created and the ones they solved. The landscape of your travel will never remain them again. Because of a man called Osama bin Laden. 
I don't travel anymore with shoes with lace because I know I will remove them at the airport. Because one man changed the landscape of your travel. And forever, Osama bin Laden will be remembered for the problem he created. In the same way, Steve Jobs will be remembered for the problem he's solving. As long as we have happy products, Steve Jobs' name will be immortalized on the sand of heaven. Judas Iscariot will be remembered for life and all eternity for the role he played in the time of redemption when he sold the Son of God and the Savior of mankind as a slave because he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave in Bible days. But the woman that broke the alabaster box of oil also, we be remembered for the problems he solved. Because Jesus said, as long as this gospel is preached, a name will be mortalized. Because you are seen as breaking a perfume on me, but she has done this for my barrier. The Roman soldiers will be remembered for kneeling the Son of God to the cross in pain and agony and torment. But forever, we're going to remember a man by name, Joseph of Arimathea, for the problem he solved. When he used his, when he leveraged his influence with the government and went to the office of Pilate in the government house and demanded for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and put him in his own tomb that was cut from the cave so that Jesus Christ will have a befitting barrier. Joseph of Arimathea may not be as popular. Arimathea may not be as popular as the other apostles. But his name today is being immortalized. Ladies and gentlemen, when the history of this church, Kingdom Ambassador's Christian Center, will be written someday on the sands of time. On what side of history are you going to be? Those who created problems or those who suffered?